so with you. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Sound good? Okay.
The Lord be with you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to worship. It's a joy to see all of you this morning, especially those of you who are guests today. Whether you're here or you're joining us online, we welcome you. Um, please take a moment to sign the guest pad in your row, pass it down, and uh, take, if you don't know anyone who's in your row, please introduce yourself. And if you do know them, still, you know, be sociable. It's always good. Uh, if you are here, you are invited to stay for refreshments after, after worship in the community room. Our last Lenten evening prayer and supper will be uh, this Wednesday. Supper will be at 5.30 and evening prayer will begin at 6.30. Uh, we are going to have our final play in our Dad's Disciples series the play that cut off right when the letter was about to be read, we're finally going to read the letter this, this Wednesday night. So you will not want to miss that. Our stewardship study will begin, on April, our book study will begin on Tuesday, April 18th. Uh, the study will be six to seven, and it will be five Tuesday nights. Uh, Kim has just created a sign-up sheet. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the community room to the left as you go in on, on one of those boards there, one of those tripods. So you can sign up, you can get your book. Please join us. Uh, prayer vigil. Carol? Sorry, they took my standee back here. <laughs> I can see you, I hope you can see me. I have just a couple of announcements today. One is uh, a reminder that if you care to give offering toward Chris or Easter flowers, not Christmas, it feels like it, but <laughs> Easter flowers that we will put out here in the worship space for Easter Sunday, there are still envelopes out there. Next Sunday is the last day to do that because then we'll have to make a list and get that in the bulletin. And then we have the prayer vigil. We talked about that a little bit. We have a box out there, a place where you can sign up if you wish to sign up for, it's a half hour time slot. If you know that you're coming, it's kind of nice to know who's going to be here in the sanctuary during that time. And we have someone in here all the time. So if, if people don't sign up to help us with that, then it's up to Tammy and Kim and I to be in here, each of us, through the whole night. So we really appreciate your help, but don't be afraid of that. If you don't want to sign up or can't commit yourself, just come anytime from, from dusk to dawn, come and pray. I think that you will find it not an enjoyable experience, but an uplifting experience. I like to think of it like pastor has the one part of the service where he talks about incense rising up. That's what I see our prayers doing, rising up to God for whatever we're praying for. And we all know that he answers prayers and he hears us. So we invite you to come and do that. And then I would like to ask Judy Hoffman to come up here, please. She has been coming for many years, she and Clark, and we're just asking for her impression. morning. Um, they asked me to say a few words about what, is that okay? What the prayer uh, vigil meant to me. Um, this is harder than I thought. Um, Holy Week is sort of a, well this is a hectic time of year. We're dealing with school activities and work and jobs and weather and all sorts of crazy things. And then when Holy Week comes it's some Sometimes it gets a little more hectic. Uh, those people on altar guild start on Palm Sunday, um, adorning the altar with palms. They're here already, so we can do that. Have palms for all of you. Uh, Monday, Thursday, we will have uh, church here, and we'll have uh, First Communion. And then we do the stripping of the altar, where we remove everything off the altar as someone is singing or chanting Psalm 22. We close Monday, Thursday by draping the altar in black. Friday is Good Friday, worship again, total dimness, black on the altar, 
And then Saturday, Alter Guild's here again, putting up white pyramids and banners, uh, Easter flowers, and we're getting ready to celebrate this wonderful, wonderful Easter season. Saturday evening is the time for me to finally think about what Easter is and what it's all about. And for me, it starts, I usually come over about 1 or 2 in the morning, um, even driving over. Not a lot of traffic. Sometimes I see the moon and the stars. Sometimes it's raining. Sometimes it's snowing. Um, coming to the church, I come in and it's dim. There's candlelight. There's twinkle lights. Some quiet music in the background. Clark used to play the organ when we were here, and he'd play all the favorite Lenten hymns. Uh, the whole church will be surrounded with stations that you can participate in, or you don't have to. If you want to just sit in your pew and, and meditate and pray, that's fine. Um, there is a suggestion box, as uh, Carol had mentioned, and there are prayers that have been made by people of Shalom, people who have called them in, who have texted them in, somebody who has a concern, something on their heart, and you can do that. Last year, one of the stations that really affected me deeply was an exhibit that they had on Ukraine. And it was a video that showed the people of Ukraine, their schools, their playgrounds, their villages, their towns. And then there were slips of paper where you could write a little prayer concerning Ukraine. What touched me that there was also a prayer slip that you could make for the people of Russia and the Russian soldiers that were over there. Um, there was a... a a touch and feel area, a huge chunk of rough wood reminding us of the cross. The crown of thorns was there so you could prick your finger on that, thro on that thorn. Big nails that might have been used to nail Jesus to the cross. And a bowl of vinegar so you could taste the vinegar that was offered to Jesus when he was on the cross. Um, after the... Uh, We spend all of the whole week getting ready for Easter. And we have all these special services, and at home the, the eggs are dyed and the baskets are made and the dinner meal is planned and the guests are coming or you're going or whatever the case might be. But the prayer vigil to me is a time where I can really connect and I can contemplate what Christ has done for me and for you. And when I leave, whether it's after a half hour, an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, whatever is, is feeling for me, I leave with a, a feeling of overwhelming awe and peace and calm. And I just, I invite you to participate in that and use it to make your Easter the best that you possibly can. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> uh, direct your Thrivent Choice dollars by March 31st, those of you who are Thrivent members. And all women of Shalom are welcome to attend the Spring Conference on April 27th. There are other announcements in the bulletin. Are there any others? Are you sure, Sam? Okay. We'll take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Jesus warns of a separation at the time of the Son of Man's glory based on works of mercy. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. To make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Thrown, hark 
cause strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of years, the potent of time, creator died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of grace and mercy, we admit to you, to ourselves, and to this community that we have caused harm to others through our actions and through our failure to act. Give us the humility to accept our failings and make things right where we can. Forgive us and help us to forgive ourselves. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In that love, God forgives you all your sin. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Also with you. Please. Let us pray. Loving God, you live in each and every one of us. Help us to see you in the face of all people, that we might act in justice and mercy to all in need. In Jesus' name, amen. A reading from Ezekiel. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? But must you tread down with your feet on the rest of the pasture? When you drink of clear water, must you follow the rest with your feet? And must the sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be the prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. Save us as you promised, we will trust. 
steadfast love come to us, O Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory, glory to, to you, you, O Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, and gave you food, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger, and welcomed you, or naked, and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Thanks. to you, O Christ. Children may come forward. song, isn't it? Yeah. Today, I want to teach you about a song. It's the 23rd Psalm, and the 23rd Psalm uh, is in the Bible, and psalm is another word for song, okay? But first, I want you to know why it's so important. So you stand up right where you are. If you have ever heard of the 23rd Psalm, would you raise your hand? Okay. If you love the 23rd Psalm, would you stand up? Pretty important, huh? They love it. They love it. Lots of times when I ask people if they want me to read to the Bible from the Bible, they'll say, read me the 23rd Psalm. So... I think they can sit down. Yeah. Sometimes it's called the shepherd's psalm, so I want to show you some stuff. That's why I brought my stool, so you can come and stand around here and look over my shoulder, okay? All right. So if we want to find the 23rd psalm or any of the psalms, we're going to look right in the middle of the Bible. Yep, there's the psalms. So that's easy, isn't it? 
It's about half of the pages are in front, about half the pages are behind. But you see the psalms, even though they're songs, we don't have any music here, because most of the time when we do the 23rd Psalm, we just read the words. There's another name for the psalm. It's called the Shepherd's Psalm, and that's what I wanted to tell you about. I brought a friend with me. His name is Agnes Day. Okay? And I've had him for a long time. And here he is. Do I have a helper who could put my Bible on one of the chairs there, please? Just, they're right by Pastor David. Perfect. This is a toy sheep, of course, right? But he's a special one because he's a puppet. And I can put my hand in here, and then we can ask him questions. Like we can say, is your wool soft? And he'd say yes. Can the children touch it? Okay, so you can touch them if you want. Sometimes wool is soft, sometimes it's a little bit scratchy. Oh, he likes that. He likes that, yeah. Do you need a shepherd? Oh, yeah. And do you know why? Because sheep can't take care of themselves very well. If you look inside his mouth, does he have any big fangs so he could fight another animal with? No, he doesn't have anything like that. So if a wild animal came, he'd be in trouble. And if we look, so he could scratch, he just has hoofs, doesn't he? He doesn't have claws. So do you need somebody to protect you? All right, so that's what a shepherd is. A shepherd is a person who takes care of sheep and makes sure that they're protected. Sometimes they're grown-up people. Sometimes there are older kids might be a, a shepherd and take care of sheep. Now, the other thing that a sheep needs to do, because he can't protect himself, he has to find safe places where he can eat. And when he eats, he can't see what's going on around him. Because look, at, can we pretend that my green sweater is some grass? Okay. And he would go down here, and he's got his head down. He can't see if somebody's coming, can he? He would take a bite of grass, and then he would chew and chew and chew and chew and chew. And then he'd have to go down again like that. And he doesn't see if there's a wolf coming, sneaking up on him. No, not at all. And the same thing when he drinks water. If I had water in my hand, he'd go like that, right? So he wouldn't be paying much attention to his safety. So he needs a shepherd to show him safe places where he can eat and he can drink. I wonder if you remember what his name is. Agnes Day, yeah. Agnes Day. That's words that mean Lamb of God. Can you say it? Agnes Day? Agnes Day. Yeah. You listen very carefully the rest of our service, and I'll bet you can hear the words Lamb of God, okay? If you hear them, you tell me when you leave the service. Say, I heard it, okay? Because that's what we call Jesus sometimes, is Lamb of God. And when we talk about the Lord is my shepherd, we're talking about God. God is the one who takes care of us. So I'm going to let another helper take um, Agnes over to Pastor David. Would you be my helper? Pastor David, right? Yep, that's him. Okay. Thank you. And finally, I found a special version. Remember, I showed you in the Bible where it talks about the Lord is my shepherd, but this is a version of the 23rd Psalm that's just for kids. So, let's see if we can find the shepherd. Where do you find him? Yep. You see what he's got in his hand? What do you think that staff and the stick are for? You, right, to guide the sheep and protect them, too. And here are the sheep they're following. Because you know what? Sheep know the sound of his voice. So if they um, hear his voice, then they'll say, oh, that's my shepherd. I'll follow him. So this one starts, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. 
The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. Do you see the still waters down here? Sheep don't like water that's splashy because that gets in their faces. So they like it nice and quiet. Okay, and look, he's taking care of these sheep up here, isn't he? He is, he is, because he's feeling how nice the wool is. You're right. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. That looks kind of scary, doesn't it? But he's helping the sheep get across from one side to the other on that narrow, narrow bridge. Uh-oh. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I see wild animals, scary wild animals. But do you think the sheep are safe? Yeah, because there's a shepherd. He's leading them. He's got his stick ready to fight off any wild animals. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. See how they have their faces right down in the grass there? Yeah. The one sheep here, he's looking to check to make sure the shepherd is there. Yeah, they do, don't they? Those are kind of those scary things, but they don't dare come close because the shepherd's protecting the sheep. You are very smart to catch that. Mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And look here, the shepherd is playing music. And we know that the 23rd Psalm is a song about a shepherd, right? Yeah, and David, who was, you sometimes maybe hear stories about King David. When he was a boy, he was a shepherd, and he used to play music for his sheep, and I think they like it. So, that's the 23rd Psalm, or the Shepherd Psalm, and it talks about how God takes care of us and protects us and helps us to have the things that we need, which is pretty cool, I think, all right? So let's say a prayer and give thanks, okay? Fold your hands, close your eyes, make your bodies nice and quiet. And if you want to repeat after me, that would be super. Dear God, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children, that means all of them too, say a really, really loud, amen. Can we make it louder, I think? Let's do it. A really, really loud, Amen. All right, that means so be it. That's how we want it to be exactly what we prayed for. Thank you very much for coming up, and you can go back to your seats. Oh, is it noisy offering today? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so focused on sheep that I forgot about that.
new phone. To start today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the sculpture you'll see on the next slide. Have any of you seen this sculpture before? It's called Homeless Jesus. And you can tell it's Jesus if you look very closely at the feet. You see the wounds in the feet. The sculpture was cast by Timothy Schmalz, a devout Catholic. And this portrays Jesus as an unhoused person sleeping on a park bench. Brings two scriptures to mind. First is Matthew 8, 58, where Jesus tells a would-be disciple, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And the second calls to mind our gospel reading today, when Jesus tells both sheep and goats, just as you did or did not do it to one of the least of these who are my siblings, you did or did not do it to me. Sculpture is provocative, it's challenging. It has had a polarizing reaction. This is borne out by the fact that several times after a copy of this sculpture is installed someplace, police have been called to report a homeless person sleeping on a park bench. In one notorious instance, the sculpture went up. 20 minutes later, the police were called. And while it's easy to look down on such collars as out-of-touch jerks who lack compassion, we may do well to examine our own discomfort first. As much as we may agree that Jesus is found in the most vulnerable, as much as we may have hearts to serve those less fortunate than we are, isn't it true that there is something about open vulnerability, this kind of naked vulnerability, that makes us deeply uncomfortable? When I lived in Chicago as a seminary student, I learned to develop blinders. Keep looking straight ahead where you're going, neither to the left nor to the right. Don't look at that guy playing drums on the street or that other guy beatboxing on the subway. Don't look at that gal selling flowers or that guy selling copies of Streetwise. And especially don't look at Harold, who likes to hang around the seminary and cycles through three or four different stories about why he needs a few bucks. Just try to get through the day. Go about your business. It becomes easier to deal with humanity when you, don't ha when you are willfully blind to its ugly side. But is this living our best life? Now this phrase is kind of a loaded phrase. It calls to mind a certain prosperity preacher who made millions promoting a book with a similar title. On top of this, the phrase, living my best life, is often, often accompanies that infernal hashtag blessed that I've ranted about a few times up here that you see on social media. That's not the kind of life we're talking about. We're talking about our best life in terms of eternal life, which Jesus speaks of today. And eternal life doesn't just begin when Jesus invites the sheep to enter the kingdom, but begins from our baptism and continues throughout eternity. What does it mean to live our best life, a shalom life, a whole life in the here and now, prepared for eternity, especially in light of this story of the last judgment? While we might think this story is uniquely terrifying, Jesus isn't saying anything here that he hasn't already said. This is just the cap on it. He's already said there will be a great separation between weeds and wheat, clothed and unclothed wedding guests, wise and foolish bridesmaids. Showing a separation between sheep and goats is just saying the same thing. The troubling thing, the problem, and what makes us so uncomfortable is that Jesus is so plain about it here. There's no mistaking his meaning. The standard for judgment is crystal clear. Works of mercy works of mercy. And while some interpreters, 
perhaps correctly, think that this standard has to do with unbelievers, that Christians are judged by a different standard, by faith in Christ and unbelievers by works of mercy. After all, you have all the nations gathered, whether they knew Jesus or not, and sheep, neither sheep nor goats know that they're serving Christ. Such an interpretation can sidestep this parable quite neatly. Well, that doesn't apply to us. Whew. That would save us quite easily from this text and from its implications. But in any case, the questions don't go away, do they? Did we, Christian or not, feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the prisoner, care for the sick, welcome the stranger? Or did we more often put on blinders? Here's the ugly truth. All too often, I am weeds. I am a foolish bridesmaid, unprepared for the groom's arrival. I am the one caught at the party without the right clothing. I am the slave who will not forgive a tiny debt after being forgiven such a huge one. I am a goat. So are most of us, I'd guess. We get so wrapped up in ourselves and our immediate concerns that we can fail to see our neighbors as neighbors. We can fail to see the image of Christ in our neighbors or even in ourselves a lot of the time. The first step to living our best life may be recognizing how desperately we need God's mercy and how desperately we need repentance. We need a radical reorientation of life, a different way of viewing ourselves and our neighbors. Like St. Paul, we often don't do the good we want to do, but we do the evil that we hate. We need grace. We need to be reformed and transformed into good wheat, into properly attired wedding guests, forgiving slaves, sheep. The good news is that this mercy, that this grace, this transformation, this radical reorientation of life is given to us freely. It's given to us by Jesus through the Spirit. Jesus, this man without a place to lay his head, this craftsman turned rabbi from backwater Galilee, this executed criminal who rose again, is God's Messiah. And on his cross, he opens his arms to all people. He opens his arms to you and to me. He leaves the 99 sheep in the wilderness so that he can bring the one lost sheep, humanity, back home. This is powerful mercy, which is given to us in our baptism, which is renewed at this communion table and lived out in the world. Such mercy is not just active on Sunday morning, of course, but it is the foundation of the whole Christian life. Living out this mercy is living our best life. Such mercy can't be contained. It will be lived out in our wider world, even in a world that seems bleaker and bleaker by the day. As Luther wrote in his small catechism, God's kingdom comes with or without our prayer, but we ask that it may also come about in us. Such mercy will be extended to those Jesus declared blessed in the Beatitudes. Remember back then, it's been a long time since we talked about the Beatitudes. But those folks, poor in spirit, the mourning, the merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, are often thought to be cursed by the world. They will receive mercy. Our choice being recipients of this mercy is this. Will we permit God's mercy to be lived out through us or not? Will we get out of God's way or not? Lutherans often don't like to talk about choices when it comes to faith because faith is, after all, a gift from God. And that's true. Our salvation is entirely the work of God. However, 
Just because our salvation is entirely God's work doesn't mean we don't have our own work to do. Just because I hope some word of God is getting through this sermon doesn't mean that I can just let the Holy Spirit inspire me up here and not do any preparation. That probably wouldn't be a very edifying experience for you. It wouldn't be very fun for me either. We have our own work to do. It's taking the blinders off. It's getting out of the way of God's mercy. It's really seeing someone else as bearing Christ's image just as we bear it. Such mercy is a way of life. And such a life is our best life. It is the fruit of the eternal life we're given in our baptism. In such mercy, there is no enough. There is no measurement. There are no points kept. It is simply our grateful response to God's gift in Jesus Christ. So we're freed, folks. We're given God's mercy so that we can be merciful. We can be the transformed people of God that God has already made us to be carrying the image of Christ, seeing Christ's image around us. Thanks be to God. Amen. With the whole church, we confess our faith. I believe God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
trusting in the promise of Jesus Christ's unending love, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Ever-present God, give us eyes to see you in the faces of others. Protect us from judging those faces and help us humbly serve you by caring for others in need. We pray for the Northwestern Minnesota Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, for our Companion Synod, the Andhra Evangelical Lutheran Church in India, for our bishops, Elizabeth and Bill, for our staff, David, Jerry, and Sam, for our Congregation Council, Brian, Carol, Kim, Arnie, Amber, Emily, and Corey. Send your spirit upon them as they work for your kingdom. Merciful God, you blessed cre your blessed creation relies upon us to take care of it. Help us preserve it, protect it, and nurture it. Make us committed stewards of this terrestrial ball and all the creatures upon it, that all may know and feel your love. Merciful God, Remind leaders of all nations to work for peace and justice for all their people. Show them ruling is not based on ideological purity or arrogance, but based on servant leadership with works of mercy done in love. Bring your peace to this world, especially for those in Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Ethiopia, Mexico, and Afghanistan. Merciful God, Strengthen and encourage caregivers, medical staff, and all who serve you by caring for the health and well-being of others. Pour your healing blessing upon all who are ill or in pain, especially Bonnie, Connie, Skip and Lisa, Phyllis, Mike, Lisa and family, Michelle, John and Carrie, Sharon, Bob, Dave, Bev, Jerry, Jeanette, Arnie and Kay, Sharon, John, Jan, Mary, those who suffer from domestic violence, addiction, and neglect, and those we name before you now, silently or aloud. Merciful God, as congregations prepare to enter the last weeks of Lent, uplift and inspire pastors, deacons, and lay leaders so they are filled with joyful hope to proclaim your gospel in words and deeds. Merciful God, Hear our prayer. we remember with thanksgiving all the saints who have provided clothing, food, shelter, invited strangers, and have spent time with people who are sick and in prison inspire us by their example to live in faithful, compassionate service to you. Merciful God. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers and those which remain unspoken in the name of Jesus, our High Priest. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you again for your support of the work of the gospel here at Shalom. You are a blessing to us, to our community, and to our world. There are several ways you can give. There's an offering basket there in the back for those of you who are here. There are other ways you can give electronically as well. If you have any questions about those, please contact the church office. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good your vows to the Most High.
safely grace for sheep may safely grace for when the shepherd guards them well when the shepherd guards them well Gently he leads them where securely they may dwell. God of justice, so many are hungry, naked, sick, and imprisoned. Give us hearts to respond generously to the needs of others and make us aware that in doing so, we are caring for you. 
we offer these gifts to your work of justice and equity in the world. Accept them, we pray, for the sake of Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who tends the wounds of body and spirit with the oil of consolation and the wine of hope, the Son of Righteousness who raises us to life on his healing wings. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come and eat. All is now ready. Now, God, you take away the sin of the mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace.
is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, earnestly Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? his mercies, mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, you are who weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is called.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Embodied God, at your table we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. Amen. The Father, the giver of love, the Son, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. We believe. 
God is calling us to invite people into a deeper relationship with Christ. So that all may discover true peace. And be prepared to follow him in compassionate service. Go in peace, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Thanks be to God.